it's my pleasure to be chairing this, uh, our first panel of the afternoon. Um, my name is Mike Bustamante. I teach Latin American history here at uh, FIU, and uh, I'm really excited to welcome four um, wonderful speakers on a topic that um, I consider uh, of high interest for my own work, and, and I'm really looking forward to hearing these presentations. So I'll just introduce each of the panelists um, briefly. Um, first, we're going to be hearing from Ricardo Pagliosa. Uh, he's a Cuban-American poet, art critic, and curator specializing in Latin American art. He has curated exhibitions and written major studies on Cuban and Latin American artists. In 2010, the Snight Museum of Art at the University of Notre Dame put together the exhibition Parallel Currents, Highlights of the Ricardo Pagliosa Collection of Latin American Art, whose book-length catalog explored the relationship among art, poetry, and philosophy in his life and work. We'll next be hearing from Dr. Barbaro Martinez Ruiz, who is Associate Professor of African and African Diaspora Art History and Head of the Department of Art History and Discourse of Art at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. His books include Engraving the World, Rupestrian Art and Migration in Central Africa, forthcoming in 2017, and Congo Graphic Writing and Other Narratives of the Sign from 2013. In 2012-2013, Dr. Martinez Ruiz curated the exhibit Things That Cannot Be Seen Any Other Way, The Art of Manuel Mendive at the Frost Art Museum in Miami. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Diana Severo Amador, a Cuban art historian, curator, and art critic. She has taught courses on Latin American art and photography at the New School, Hunter College, and NYU. She was also assistant curator of the Montreal Biennial in 2007 and co-curated the exhibition Cuba Art and History from 1868 to Today, held at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts in 2008. She has written and lectured extensively on Cuban art and photography. And last but not least, we will hear from Maria Antonia Cabrera Harus, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar at New York <coughs> University. She holds a PhD in sociology from the New School. She has written extensively on material culture in post-revolutionary Cuba, especially on fashion. She is the uh, creator of the blog Cuba Material, which I encourage you all to check out, uh, dedicated to archiving and disseminating Cuban material culture from the Cold War era. So I'll just remind our panelists that you each have 20 minutes. I've been told by Jorge de Mi bastante estricto with the time. Um, so if I pass you threatening notes, don't take it personally. Um, with that, we'll welcome Ricardo Pagliosa to the mic. I'm actually looking forward to threatening notes. Luces, I put it on Good afternoon. And um, I'll be focusing today on, on area of uh, Cuban diaspora art, I refer to as theatricality, um, which involves uh, references, uh, which, or the use of scenarios in or symbol based narratives, or both, in representations of action, which shed light on the poetics of shelter. Obviously, from the standpoint of the diaspora, uh, which I define as the as a period which comes after exile, when exile becomes prolonged, and there's a substantial percentage of a of a nation's population, as is the case in Cuba, that has uh, fled the country and lives elsewhere. Then you have the creation of a transterritorial culture. Uh, a culture which in some ways, because of its transterritoriality, basically defines its maturity. It is able to continue to modify, reflect on, change, alter, develop new codes within a tradition. That's all a tradition is, a dynamic. I have, in, in my writings on Latin American art and Cuban art, I focus on, on the use of tropes or certain figures uh, in, in to, to study the way that artists think visually in Latin American culture, uh, in modernist art in particular, representation was not rejected in the way it was in modernist art uh, in, in Western Europe um, because of the great traumas of, of the First World War, in particular the Europeans 
and even before, we're already rejecting certain models of representations. Hence the emergence of abstraction and, and various styles that reduced, you know, what can we take out of a work of art and still have a work of art. In Latin America, the, uh, this, the emergence of modernism coincides with this new nationalism, this new interest in, in projecting one's national identity. And so it became a very different phenomenon. Uh, yes, the, the codes like you know, cubism and constructivism and, and surrealism. Surrealism being probably the only European uh, modernist movement which embraced representation because of its basis in psychoanalysis and so forth. But all the others basically always saw representation as a problem. So tropes became very important. Uh, and, and human art in particular, uh, how, how do I move this forward? Oh, it's the one that goes back, it's the one that goes forward. Ah. Yes, that's very <laughs> <really. laughs> theatricality is based a lot on, on the emergence and the great interest in architectural motifs in, in Latin American art, and particularly in Cuban art. The great founder of Cuban modernism, the great primary figure of the first generation, Amelia Velas, gives us a perfect example of, of that. The paintings fuse the stained glass window with the, with the uh, synthetic cubist uh, idiom. And it is, I guess, a quintessential example of what I mean by metaphor in art. Two things are connected and fused into one image. Uh, metaphor, one of those tropes that I used to study, is a, is a very common thing. Of course, we often use it just to refer to, you know, literature, uh, uh, discourse, uh, language, but obviously it affects all aspects of life. You know, we can't live without tropes. And so here we have a very good example of that in in Belize. and it also sets the scene for what would later emerge. Uh, another of the primary figures, of course, is Carlo Enriquez. And the primary trope that governs his missensibility with metonymy. Metonymy, metaphor based on resemblance and a fusion to one thing. Uh, metonymy implies a transference of values from one thing to the next, which are approximate to each other. Um, and so in, in Carlo Enriquez, this voluptuary uh, imagery of fire and transparency is, is you know, a good example of metonymy. These first generation figures um, generally uh, focused on one trope. Uh, and as, as modernism and as you know, La Guardia progressed in, in human art, these tropes became more complex. It's several tropes functioning at the same time. Uh, with Bella Lan and Cecil de Son Cheval series, gives us a good example of how this, this assumes a, a totemic kind of presence. These various factors, the horse, the woman, vegetation, uh, African or uh, iconography or, or semantics, actually more the art of Papua New Guinea in terms of forms, all these references assume a kind of um, juxtaposition and, and a kind of metonymy, but it's centered on the body, on the figure, and that because it starts off yet another of these traditions. Probably the the, the clearest emergence of uh, the first emergence of a theatrical motif uh, emerges in the work of Mario Garren, in particular, the work of the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, after he left Cuba and moved to Chile. And here we see, you know, how metaphor, you know, the, the woman's head, of course, uh, resembling the compotera, the, the fruit bowl, and how uh, geometric forms. Uh, uh, silhouettes are juxtaposed with, you know, volumetrically modeled forms. And, and we have that surrealist third dimension uh, introduced into the picture. But significant is that it is, it, it's all embraced in a, in, a, in a highly theatrical sort of mode. We, we, we feel like we're actually seeing a, a, a what's that I say, a mise en scène, an actual stage of some kind. 
Gul Hormudis, that we see that again. Now Carreño and, and Gul Hormudis are primary figures who emerge as the second generation that starts in the, coming up in the late 40s, in the 40s actually, and, and, and uh, many of them would wind up uh, living outside of Cuba. Uh, and so here we begin to see the carryover of this, this interest in a theatrical space. This is significant because theatricalization uh, embraces this whole idea of a representation. The, work, the, the painting becomes a world unto itself. And, 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 and like, as we, we would when we see a theatrical production or a movie, we have all these dynamics operating. Um, the whole idea of um, psychical distance. What is the, the, the subject's relationship, emotional and psychic, to, to what's going on on the stage uh, and going to, be, going to fiction. If it's too close, you feel too intimately involved. Uh, uh, Edward Ballow gives the example of a jealous husband watching Othello. Uh, it would probably be highly uncomfortable watching that if it was too close to the, to the subject matter. But likewise, if you're not interested in, in what's happening, then you're too far away. You lose all ability to suspend disbelief, to entertain it as a viable alternative reality. And so these are some of these factors which start the process going. Interestingly, in both of these, the previous films in this already, these artists are in exile, and the theatricalization of their work augments as a result. Um, like Mr. Jose Mijar, as a primary third generation figure who lived here in Miami, uh, we see is, again, this whole idea of these uh, these figures. He came out of the, the constructivist, the concreto movement, and then veered back into surrealism. This is kind of very common in Latin America. We have a lot of figures who start, you know, have a period which is, you know, hard edge constructivist geometric abstraction, and then they go off and they become, and they wind up re-embracing representation in a highly oneric emphasis. Uh, this is not unusual in Latin America at all. It would be in Europe where surrealists and constructivists usually uh, try to kill each other on the streets of Paris. Made art a lot more interesting. Agustin Fernandez, uh, another important third generation figure, uh, especially in these uh, bird women series, kind of like reconnects us with the totemic figure of the Lam that we saw. Um, part of the theatricalization, uh, that current which starts with Lam, involves the figure as the scenario. This is another one of these like, currents that are off current from that. The figure itself, the body, becomes a theatricalized context. Uh, which, which I think plays into also on a, on a very deep level to what diaspora and exile means. You know, the, the great adventures, the epics of life, the, the great questions start assuming a, a new scenario, which is the body. The body, of course, is a metaphor of the mind and of the, and of the memory, as is architecture. You mustn't forget that architecture, one of the great um, semantic concepts of architecture is that it is a model of memory. Uh, Uo Oswega, who was a painter as well as, a, as an architect, uh, often gives us these turbulent uh, corporeal abstractions, and yet somehow often sort of like situated within a kind of insinuated room. You see, kind of like a window, maybe an enclosure, uh, almost like a, like a, a, a zooming in to the turmoil within, uh, but always with that architectural reference that restores or brings in that theatrical element, that space which pulls us out and tells us this is a fiction which, which we can all empathize with, have a catharsis, and so forth. All the, all the dynamics of the, of the theatrical scenario. Amino Sanchez, another third generation figure, famously focused on that, that dynamic, also on the, the relationship between abstraction and, and architecture. Um, and repetition. Here we have another trope, the trope of synecdoche. I love these lovely, unpronounceable Greek terms for these terms. And by the way, they're excellent names for children. <laughs> Autonomy, have you done your homework? Uh, synecdoche, <laughs> stay with the traditional model. Um, the synecdoche um, uh, is what a part of something substitutes or indicates or codifies a pattern that extends to infinity. See this, of course, in geometric 
uh, abstraction. And here we have these windows, which theoretically is a pattern that can extend itself in these different directions forever. So the painting is, is, a, is a, a fragment, a specimen of a pattern that goes on and on perceptually. Which is in many ways, I guess, what, what all theater is, it's synecdochic. When we see a play, let's say, or see a movie, it's interesting to us, even if it's like the saga of a family, only because it, it sort of stands in for, you know, everything that's going on in the society. Otherwise, we would watch this, you know, uh, unless it's a telenovela, in which case, then I don't have an explanation for that. But, uh, another instance of how, you know, representation and borrows from the, 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 the tropes of, 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 uh, of geometric abstraction, in the case of Utawa uh, and so again, these patterns in, in, in sort of point to the whole idea of an involving space which is intimate with the infinite. This is another of the powers of tropes you know, that brings that into uh, painting. You can't have that kind of interest in tropologically introducing ideas into visual art unless you have a profound embrace of representation um, in, in a tradition. Another, you know, artist whose, whose work is, you know, highly uh, uh, oriented to this whole idea of the of theater as a governing trope and all the internal tropes and that would be Julio de Ras. And this painting called uh, The Intruder, uh, you know, and, and often the the diasporic individual, the exile, is kind of like an intruder. The monkey who has entered into the house and is rearranging uh, the fruit or seizing them or forcing himself into a still life into which he was not invited, but is now there forever. Maria Brito, um, another of these major figures. Now we're entering into the, the Woodla Ras, we enter the world of the fourth generation figures, uh, many of whom. Uh, came already as an adolescent or young adults and really matured as artists in in uh, exile. Um, after the conquest, gives us a scenario with an object. Uh, so the, the chair, symbolic of you know something very terrestrial, four directions or cardinal points, uh, is intersected with these angelic wings, the spiral of the telephone cord. You do remember where telephone cords were. Uh, I'm afraid this is a sculpture which, for the next generation, will have to be footnoted. <laughs> <laughs> a telephone what? <laughs> and of course it's floating on these, these clouds and it, it ends on a disc with an ear. The ear is, it rhymes with the wings and it's also surrounded by cloud forms. So it's this beautiful metonymic transference as well as metaphorical. It, the whole thing becomes a scenario. Um, how much time I got left? Five? Not really? Okay. El Pablo de mi casa. It's children's rhyme. I'm not going to sing it. Um, so here we have like a fragment of this, you know, in, uh, internal space, which becomes, of course, a highly oneric space, uh, and, and brings us, you know, directly now into this, like, the power of these theatrical representations. Um, in Jose Redia, um, we're now entering, you know, the next generation that follows, fifth generation. We have, uh, interestingly, this this uh, this great action. The figure is trying to escape from the spirit of this woman calling out to him. She, we know she is. She's emerging from the water. She is calling out. Her voice is his face is a shadow. Of course, this Jungian shadow motif. He becomes a hunted animal. He is trying to escape to cut a path in Honda and to triumph accordingly. But he cannot, he is held back by a mountain of memory. So flight is, in a, is impossible. Um, the whole thing becomes a very, very complex trope. Now we're entering the world of complex tropes, as we did with Maya Rico, and we're entering now this, this very, we have metaphor, we have metonymy, we've got synecdoche, the patterns. Uh, all these things are now being jostled together in one vortex. Why? Because we're familiar with that tropological mode of representing, and it becomes very familiar. Uh, here we have these architectural elements being driven along by this great flood, which itself also assumes these geometric components, which brings us to with synecdoche. And there's a firefly that is spun out and traveling in the opposite direction, this ancient insect, uh, which is sort of like an archetypal figure of a, 
angelic and at the same time very terrestrial. Back to that chair. Ana Martina Vergao, the figure is dancing, swirling her, she's looking up, her dress is billowing out, and it becomes a, a cell, it becomes a universe of different forms, as even this very strange creature uh, floating uh, along in this in this wonderful green murk full of light. And of course that circle gets picked up by all the steps that she leaves. And uh, also, again, we have pattern, we have metaphor, we have all of them now coming together in one image. Um, and now, of course, the body, again, has become uh, important as a, as a scenario, as a theatrical set. And finally, the work of Rosales Halil, who came fairly recently from Cuba, has this very interesting series of sculptures, these three-dimensional, almost like retablos, very theatrical in, in terms of its presentation, these angelic figures trapped in this thing, the silhouette of which is a reminder of, of automobiles, which emerge also in some of these sculptures. These are strange angelic figures who have uh, telescopes and binoculars, and, and also dramatizes directly the, the, the sort of culture shock of somebody coming from from uh, Cuba and then confronting, you know, uh, you know, skyscrapers and you know modern life and and quakers that go in opposite directions. <laughs> the series is called uh, Sirena de Valento, or Siren from an inland siren. Something is beckoning from not just inland but from the deep unconscious and. And, and dramatizes this whole idea of both isolation and, and characters that are coming together in a very uh, dreamlike and at the same time a haunting uh, theatrical space. How much time do I have? Two minutes. Not back. Okay. All right. So, um, let's see. Um, there are many other artists, of course. I mean, I'm just using here sampling. Um, that, um, that, that you know, connect with this theme, among them Humberto Castro, Tomás Esson, Eduardo Michelson, Ramón Alejandro, Roberto Reyorca, Luis Brujas Aceta, Paul Sierra, Alexandro Morales, Carlos Llor. I mean, there's so many others. Uh, photographers, too, Carlos Jovenech, uh, Silvia Bizama. Um, and um, so, this is just simply a way of exploring how how diaspora has has taken and, and ripened and extended this idea of the architectural motif as a theatrical space to explore different ideas about what it means to live in a in a country of one's mind. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you. This is so much, uh, now hear from Dr. Barbara Martinez, please. Uh, presented this morning. 
in a way, it's come back to bring all these issues into perspective. And I'm interested in uh, something I call the deficit model. The deficit model means it's a kind of assumption African people um, being transported to America empty-handed and empty-minded. Uh, and this idea of, of having a culture, of having a, a legacy, it's very difficult to reconstruct when you don't have a kind of material evidence that prove you, uh, you have an actual culture. Um, you are holding it upside down. It's no, you are holding it upside down. There. Right. Cuban art, and, and we go to the next level, Afro-Cuban art, it's that kind of hyphenation we are sort of like to do more time. Um, and I just wanted to, this idea of a quest for art, it being a, a focus of fascination for people who study, in my case, African art, it's kind of the feeling of history in which I produce most of my scholarship, but I want to bring back into, but the, in order to talk about this, I wanted to just go back to refresh our memory that African and specific in, in, in Central Africa, that's it, to have an incredible influence, 35% of uh, Afri African uh, people being transported to Cuba came from that particular region. And it shows example of systematic destruction of African culture over centuries. All the way from um, Pigafetta in the 16th century, Kawasi, uh, 17th century, and the 19th century photography, all of the, all of the free evidence show burning and destruction of African art, African art, as we call it right now, in a certain context. And in the second layer of it had to do with the mockery, but it go back, go back to the images of Alandalus that being referred to before, humor and mockery as a way to frame or portray specific uh, African belief and African culture or religions. But the fact is African uh, presence in Cuba, the African succeeds to make a life in Cuba, Africans negotiate their way into the society. African managed to coexist with different types of people, not just from Africa, also from different parts of the world, in that place we call uh, Cuba. And uh, there is uh, something affecting specific the study of uh, African contribution in human art is the generalization about African, African art. Afro-Cuban art is a term being used since the 80s. And uh, what is beyond is kind of social cultural generalization. So only talk about issues of race, um, social uh, limitations or presence in society. What are the specific principles that we use to define Africa <coughs> in the context of Cuba? We never even talk about it. Um, it's possible to specify uh, uh, artistic uh, traditions in, in the context of Cuba that doesn't have to do with Western tradition. That is something that we haven't really fully um, um, present in a kind of convincing way. Um, how Afro-Cuban art fit into the kind of regional narrative, the narrative of Caribbean art and <coughs> American art. That is something that we need to somehow to, to deal with. But I guess given a sense that this is an image being presented today in the first presentation of Van Castle. And, um, and there was a, a a particular project being dedicated to America, but I wanted to focus the attention. This is the first representation of African art that being used to talk about a particular reality outside Western context, Pacific Europe. And it's a piece on the right, it's an Akisian, Condi, and Gudia, that being documented as part of this uh, wealth of images that represent a particular reality. That mean African art being as part of uh, imaging that represents America as a whole. Well, this 
a specific example of images we struggle with the images because in a way going back to the typical uh, reading of this colonial um, uh, determination and the way we uh, uh, approach those kind of images. And this is an example from uh, Dapper, who never been in that city, but did a series of representation based on ethnographic uh, data, people who used to travel, used to be deployed in those places, specifically from the Dutch embassy in Rwanda in the 17th century. And you can see an example on the, on the left, this uh, uh, push and loss was a doctor, a German doctor was sent to Central Africa to study traditional medicine. And I found this image in the Yale uh, library, medical library. And it's an image that had to do with an uh, expert in medical, uh, medical expertise in the Congo, a local Nganga Mahuku, that provide specific information about plants to uh, uh, lodge during the time of his uh, 20 years research. And the last one is a postcard that showed an Nganga Mahuku. All they would have something in common, the headdress, uh, use a feather on the head. And this is a two example of uh, two American Marines that uh, went with uh, deployed with the American Army. That this information had been initiated for Cuban religion and, uh, during the time of the American occupation in Cuba in, um, at the beginning of the 20th century. They used exactly the same headdress uh, that you can see go back to this long tradition uh, from the Congo. But, uh, now, how we define this Afro-Cuban tradition in relation to Africa? How it can be Afro-Cuban? How different could be that tradition in relation to Africa? Which Africa tradition? From West Africa, from Central Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, Northern Africa? We haven't really get into that. It's something, that kind of organization making a lot of problems in terms of a theoretical framework we need to use to define that. How different is from um, African American tradition or Afro Caribbean or Afro Latin American. That is something that is emerging right now. That specifically in Harvard is creating a, an entity for Afro Latin American art, uh, cultural study, that in a way uh, prevents to uh, spaces of inquiry like Caribbean art have been in the making for 50 years and somehow become a second hand uh, disciplinary space. How African culture uh, diversity fit into this uh, new generalization? How the problem of paradigms of race and soul is something that's being corrupted, that uh, prevented us to talk about important issues of culture paradigms in relation to African tradition. And, and the desire for authenticity, that is something that uh, still forcing most of the people who write about African art or African diaspora find for this authentic trope that can be used to characterize these traditions. This is another example, images that they are embedded in a very important moment, this moment of encountering African people. This is, uh, uh, Tony Akabas, who spent 35 years of his life in the Congo, was sent by the Vatican by the Pope, and he did this incredible book about custom and habits of the Congo people. <coughs> um, and he illustrated his uh, travel narrative as a, as a way, it would be the early proto travel narrative with those images. And when we see this image, we said, this is a typical representation, it's kind of a colonial moment in which Europeans have a narrow view of the African culture. I wanted to challenge this kind of image 